So yeah, welcome all of you here. Um, I'm very happy to see so many different faces and um, I'm really excited to have the chance to talk about Apache Spark versus cloud native SQL engines here at EuroPython. And I hope this talk will be as equally exciting to you as it was for me preparing it. Well, and I guess few of you may have stumbled across the talk title, Apache Spark versus um, cloud native SQL engines, where we're comparing a single technology against the whole stack of technologies. And to be honest, there is an alternative um, talk title which is more explicit and more appropriate, but which wouldn't be as suitable um, for a conference talk um, title. But soon we will um, figure out uh, what this um, more appropriate title actually is. Um, to start with, um, there will be a short preamble um, describing my motivation, so why did I came up with this talk in the first place, and also a bit about my intention, that I want, what do I want to achieve with this talk, and then we will dive into um, the comparison. Before we start comparing, we first have to understand the context in which we compare those two competitors. Once we've done this, I will quickly and briefly and say a few words about Apache Spark and those cloud native SQL engines for all of you who may not be so familiar with it. And then we will do a deep dive on three specific distinctions that sets apart Apache Spark from those cloud-based computation engines. And then we can derive implications based on those distinctions, which will then gu guide us to understand or to like provide a recommendation when to choose which technology. That's the overall idea. Um, so let's start off, start off with the motivation. Um, why have a talk about this topic in the first place? Well, from my personal perspective, um, I studied psychology and I got into touch with programming via statistics, started off using R, then gradually developed uh, more into the, towards the Python world, Python, Python ecosystem, and basically never looked back and ended up mainly using Spark, but also SQL in my day-to-day -day, um, work. Um, and I always had this confusion about the coexistence of so many various computation engines. You can use a data frame API, you can use SQL, there are some other declarative approaches to describe or to translate business logic into data pipelines. And also, this is also like a motivating factor here that my company, we had to make a strategic business decision um, regarding a future analytic analytics platform. And for this, at its core, we have to decide to use like a single engine or multiple computation engines. So this was also like a motivating factor um, um, coming up with this talk. So what might be motivating reasons for you to come here if you're using um, Spark or simulated or like um, associated technologies in your day-to-day -day work, then it's a no-brainer. But maybe for those who are more new to the topic, um, you will get a kind introduction to what analytical batch workloads are. And I hope that you can develop an intuition about the conceptual differences between different or various computation engines. And hopefully also in the end, we will understand what um, practical implications arise when choosing one technology over the other. So what's my intention? Um, I touched a bit. Um, I don't want to bash any other technology. Um, as I said, I'm mainly a Spark user, even though I use SQL also on a daily basis, but my roots are more in the open source Spark world. Um, I want to outline trade-offs between different approaches, and that's really important for me. I want to, emphasis, um, I want to put emphasis on a complementary view um, of those worlds. And in the end, it all boils down to choosing the right tool for the right problem. And in the end, um, hopefully we will be able to um, fill out all those question marks. So we see that we have our two competitors there on the left. We have Spark and we have those cloud native SQL engines. And then I picked um, six dimensions on which we will compare those two competitors. And in the end, there will be a pattern that we can discover, which then will guide us to a recommendation. Okay, so let's get to the actual um, content part. Um, first, as I said before, we want to set, um, we want to understand the context in which we compare those two um, technology choices. Um, and then we can talk about Spark and our cloud native SQL engines. But first, what are analytical batch workloads? When talking about analytical workloads, well, there is no much data in the first place. So in order to collect data, we have to talk about transactional databases or transactional workloads. So let's imagine we do have a web shop, for example, and there are different real-world entities such as customers, there are orders, there are shipments, and we want to capture those real-world um, entities with data or in data in the database. And we want to do so in a very consistent and valid way. Um, and transactional databases, they provide the means to do so. So we have concepts such as primary keys, foreign keys, we have like non-null non, non constraints, we have like non-duplicated um, constraints, we do have asset compliance, atomicity, consistency, isolation, and durability, and those are very, um, those functions, or like this functionality is really required in order to, to, to um, capture the outside real world in data. 
So this, like transactional databases, they really constitute the backbone of our daily business operations, and they're more focused on specific entities for a specific point in time, and they are really associated with all those CRUD operations. So individual rows, like individual items, we create them, we query them, we update them, and we might also delete them. In contrast with analytical um, workloads, we are not so much concerned about getting like a very consistent and valid um, state of the outside reality, but rather we want to access already existing data, which has been provided, for example, by transactional workloads. And then we want to understand or we want to derive insights from historical data in order to drive um, future decision making. Hence, we ask different questions here. We might ask, well, what is the most frequent error state for all our printing machines or all devices over the last five years? So that's a complete different thing, a complete different story here. And also the access pattern here is also very different because now we have like aggregations across a huge amount of rows. And hence the underlying data layout is also different because we're accessing here now columns where we have a typical filter condition, for example, we do have group bias and then we have those aggregations. So in this case, um, in comparing our competitors, we talk about analytical workloads, not about transaction workloads. Next, um, batch and streaming. Well, this is more obvious. Well, with batch um, processing, what typically happens is that as soon as a data or an event occurs, we don't transfer and process the data right away, but rather we wait until um, a certain threshold. This could be like a logical threshold, such as like a session is complete or a sequence um, has finished and then um, we start processing and collecting the data. In contrast with streaming, as soon as an event occurs, we transfer it and reprocess it. Process it. And those trade-offs, they're also fairly obvious. With streaming, we have um, near real-time um, information, so a very low latency, whereas with batch processing, there's a high latency because we only invoke processing once in a while. However, batch processing has one, um, actually two major benefits. The first one is here on the slide, it's highly efficient. We can apply multiple optimizations on transferring the data, storing the data, and processing data. Whereas with stream processing, there is large overhead by individually um, processing each and every event. And this one, the second um, um, benefit with batch processing, which is not written here, unfortunately, um, is about complexity. So when you think about like an unlimited and continuous stream of data, um, you may have like late arriving data, you have missing data, you may have duplicated data, and you have to um, account for those, um, those um, difficulties. With batch, it can occur as well, but it is, it's, it's less likely. And with, with batch data, if you have like a complete session of data, it's easier to reason about, and it's also easier to implement pipelines for batched data. So we've set the stage. We say we do compare those two competitors um, in the frame of analytical batch workloads. So next, um, what is Apache Spark? Um, for those of you who might be not so familiar with it, in general, it's a computation engine. It's a distributed fault uh, tolerant computation engine. That means it can run on your single machine, it can run in a cluster, you can scale out. Um, it's fault tolerant, that means if you run it on commodity hardware and a single worker fails, that's no issue. By design, you can recover um, instead of um, 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 rerunning the entire job. It has many, um, many connectors to all imaginable um, data sources. So we can see that we can um, connect it to uh, streaming sources. You can connect it to a trans transactional databases, to HDFS object stores, mainly everything that you can uh, think of. And also one thing that's special about Spark is it provides many different interfaces to um, work with it. You have an R interface, you can write plain SQL. We have Python, PySpark, you can use Scala and Java. Now, what are these cloud native SQL engines? Well, they are fairly obvious, the name already um, describes it. Well, they are cloud native, like engines which only run in the cloud, and they are SQL native, meaning that they have like a main SQL interface. There are some exceptions here. For example, we see Snowflake here on the slide. Well, Snowflake now also, also provides a data frame API, but um, this is less known and this is fairly recent. So I just left Snowflake there on the slide too. So now we had this brief introduction about the context. We had a brief introduction about Apache Spark, and we also had a brief introduction about our cloud-native SQL engines. Perhaps one thing I should mention, because it's also written on the slide here, um, Snowflake, Redshift, um, and BigQuery, those are data warehouses because they also have a storage engine. However, um, if you look for Spark and if you look at benchmarks open, you will find um, Spark being compared with other um, data warehouse um, computation engines. So in this case, they usually compete in the market, so I think it makes sense to add them here because with Snowflake, you can process um, iceberg data as an external table, or you can also process Paki files. Um, um, so they have the right to be here on the cloud-native SQL engine side. 
So let's get ready. And, and let's first um, focus on three major distinctions that I picked. Um, the first one is the SQL versus Data Frame API. This is like the, the part with the most depth. I will spend a lot of time on this one. Then we do have the runtime flexibility and we do have the vendor independence. Let's focus, um, focus first on SQL and Data Frame API. And of course, we have to start with SQL for a good reason, um, because SQL is quite old. It's more than half a century old. And that's something that um, really still astonishes me, that nowadays we're using a language which has its roots in the 70s. And there was Edgar Cott who first um, um, like discovered, invented um, a relational model for data. So nowadays we are so so um, so used to like a 2D um, representation of data that we think in Excel tables, for example, or like in database tables. But back in the day, um, data analysts they had to spend a lot of um, time um, implementing stuff to store and to retrieve data. Nowadays it's all just declarative. We don't have to care about how we store data mainly or mostly. But back in the day, that was not the case. However, there was one drawback um, with his um, original language to interact with the data. It was quite complex. So four years later, um, um, Donald Chamberlain and um, Raymond Boyce, they were like the, um, they, were, they gave birth to SQL as we know today. Um, and this is like almost 50 years ago that they described SQL um, um, at the first time. And um, there's a little fun fact to it. So we can see SQL on the paper written there. Um, so really SQL and not SQL. And we, you might wonder why do we use SQL sometimes, others say SQL. Well, the point is that there was um, a British aircraft company, well, if, if Wikipedia is right, um, they put a trademark, or they trademarked the word SQL. And hence they had to rename it as to SQL. That's why there are different um, variations of how to pronounce um, SQL or SQL. I found this funny. Um, but anyway, um, like the really the astonishing part here is that SQL is half a century old, but nowadays it's more popular than ever. And that's also the reason why all those like modern cloud native computation engines, they have picked up SQL as their primary interface to translate like business demands, business requirements into data pipelines. And there must be good reason for, for this, why those like major players, they chose SQL. And well, a good reason is it because um, SQL was designed as a human readable declarative language. And you can just use it in that way. Um, with, you have high level capabilities like our CRUD operations here, um, which makes it really um, um, or fairly easy to use, to understand, to onboard, um, even for those people who are not like programmers by heart. However, um, even though SQL excels in this regard, um, it has some drawbacks. And now I want to focus on those drawbacks without bashing SQL, um, hopefully, um, too hard here. Um, um, and the point is SQL lacks the ability to create powerful abstractions. Um, in common general purpose programming languages, we do have constructs such as control flow structures, if, else, for example, loops, for loops, while. Um, we do have object-oriented features. So we can use inheritance, composition, polymorphism, and others. Um, we do have error handling, like try, accept, finally. And we, of course, we can create our own custom types, like non-scalar types. But these, these things were not part um, um, of the SQL language um, in the first place. And interestingly, well, of course, there was a requirement for such features. Um, other um, database vendors, such as Oracle, they developed their own dialect or their own kind of PL SQL. PL stands for procedural language here, which then first included control, for, con control flow structures and error handling, and also possibly did the same with PG SQL. And this was long before um, the actual SQL ANSI standard specified these functionalities. So ANSI stands for American National Standardization Institute. So this is like the general overall specification of the SQL language. And um, me being this kind of new to this entire programming world was asking, well, why isn't there like a wealthy ecosystem of libraries in the SQL space? It's similar to Python. Why isn't there like a PyPI install pandas for SQL? It's just not there. And we might wonder why. And um, while doing some bit of research on that, um, I came across a blog post from the HDB guys. And they, this is a quote from their blog post, they say, well, SQL lacks orthogonality. That's a, um, like a, um, a feature of a language. Yeah, that describes the language's ability to compose more complex constructs from simple building blocks. If I say this in my own words, in my own intuition, that means um, if a language um, has a, um, a set of core instructions that you can use in a very consistent and predictable way, well, then you can create powerful abstractions based on this uh, core set of um, keywords. 
And this doesn't seem to be the case with SQL. And um, <laughs> as a fun fact, um, well, the SQL 2016 specification now includes more than 360 keywords. So just imagine having Python with more than 100 keywords, hard to remember. Like C has 32 keywords, and we build operating systems on top of this. Python 3.11 now has 35 keywords. In Python, everything is an object. You can pass around a function as an object, a class is an object, even a module is an object, everything is an object, and you can just pass them around. Think of SQL, well, stored procedures are already a bit awkward, and how can you can, like, pass around stored procedures in a stored procedure? It doesn't work that way. Um, and maybe also to giving a bit more um, um, also a hint on this, if you, if you type uh, Google, this is my like, um, own search history, so this uh, result is not really representative. However, if you type in SQL ecosystem, you would expect like, a, a large wealth of libraries and stuff. But what you will find, for me at least, Databricks SQL. Well, Databricks is not really well known for SQL. They're rather known for Spark, so they did some, they did some really good advertising here. And also, if you look like at the result at the bottom, it says data management with SQL for ecologists. I'm asking for the ecosystem. Why isn't there like, like the first major result, ecosystem, SQL ecosystem? So I went further and asked um, um, ChatGPT, um, um, and what does ChatGPT say? And it says, yes, finally, there is a rich ecosystem surrounding SQL. And if you go through, well, yes, there are database management systems, there are clients and whatsoever. But down at the bottom, I highlighted what SQL says, help developers interact with databases using programming languages constructs instead of writing raw SQL query. So that's not me manipulating JetGPT. It's just JetGPT what it crawled from the web. Yeah. Um, and now let's give a very concrete example here. Um, that's also part of my day-to-day -day job. Uh, we do have uh, IoT data, we have pipelines that we have to monitor, and I have to track if there's data incoming every hour. And um, to set up such a monitoring um, view, um, I have to first generate a date range or a base range that contains all um, relevant date units. Um, I can't just um, read the raw data because if there's data missing, I just won't see it in the dashboard. Hence, I have to create this date range base range in the beginning. So how to do this um, with SQL? So that's the challenge here. And that's like one thing or like one concrete example where I stumbled across. Um, if you use PostgreSQL in this case, well, this one looks nice. We do have a select. Then there is some function generate series. And then this must be the start timestamp. Then this is like the end timestamp. And then we say the interval. Would be nice to have some keyword arguments here so I know what the parameter is about. But that's a different story. So with PostgreSQL, we're just fine. I take this. So let's move on with MS SQL. Um, the first part is nice. It says uh, declare start date and end date. So this is fairly, fairly explicit. And then we do have a select with date add. OK, we have some date add function here in the beginning. OK, I'll just take this. Um, there's some number minus 1. Hmm. And then we have, within the from clause, we do have a subquery. And then it says select row number over, order by some C object ID. And this is taken from a systems uh, column C. So this is already a bit, what is going on here? This is not fairly straightforward. So the level of abstraction here is somewhat strange. Um, take it further, Redshift. Um, this looks very similar to PostGre, and this is not by accident, but um, on purpose because Redshift is based on PostGre dialect. But the like, weird thing here is, um, well, we have a get date, cast it to date. Why do I need to do such thing? Well, it's called get date and then cast it to date. Why do I need to do this? And then I subtract this series that I generate later, and then I cast it to date again. Yeah, that's fishy, but I can understand this. Um, let's take a look at BigQuery. Ah, that's spicy. Um, um, I don't go into detail here, but we see some subquery, yet another subquery, some write padding split. This is the accepted answer on Stack Overflow for generating a date range with BigQuery. How awkward is that? Um, I will skip um, Snowflake here just to show this. There's even an example of recursive queries to generate the date range. It gets really funny. So what I'm trying to show here is that we are using a tool for an issue that doesn't seem to be as suited for this. OK, so we talked about SQL, about its birth um, 50 years ago, and um, um, about some deficiencies of the language. Now let's focus more on the data frame API. This is more quicker. Um, in general, we can say data frame APIs, they are embedded in general purpose languages, such as Python or Scala. And being um, embedded in a general purpose language, all those concepts that we know from SQL, such as table projection, filters, transformations, they are explicitly mapped into object representations. So we don't have a table anymore. We just call it a data frame. And then we have attributes on those data frames, such as column names and D types. And we do have methods 
such as like a filter join and aggregate. And um, the great thing um, about a data frame API being embedded in general purpose language is that we gain all the functionality and also we can participate in this rich ecosystem that those languages provide. And that's a major difference. So summing up, our first distinction, we can say Spark offers both SQL and a data frame API, whereas there's cloud native SQL engines, well, they just have SQL mainly. That's the first distinction. Second distinction, this is fairly quick, well, um, where can I execute um, those engines? Well, with Spark, you can run it on your local machine, you can run it in your CI CD environment, you can run it on premises, you can run it like on your own um, EC2 instances in the cloud, or you can use many various managed services for Spark. However, in contrast with cloud native SQL engines, as the name suggests, well, then this only runs in the cloud. When it comes to vendor independence, Spark is open source. Um, whereas those cloud native SQL engines, they're mainly governed by specific cloud providers, such as Azure Synapse or AWS Athena. And then maybe they also like enterprises, um, such as Databricks. Databricks now also offers like an SQL engine. Um, so we do have, um, um, yeah, we do have a less of a lock-in lock -in, or vendor lock-in if we are going for Spark. So um, as I mentioned in the beginning, um, there's an alternative title to the talk, and um, this one would be the Run Anywhere Vendor Independent Data Frame API versus the Cloud-Only Proprietary SQL for Analytical Batch Loads. But I hope that you agree that this title would be a bit um, less uh, suitable um, for a conference. So knowing Apache Spark will it probably attract a bit more, but behind Apache Spark, it basically says you can run it anywhere, it's vendor independent, and it has a data frame API. Okay, so now we've um, um, talked about those um, distinctions. Now let's try, let's try to derive implications that are based, or that can be, um, 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 that result from those distinctions. Um, there are six dimensions that I want to focus on, managing complexity, testing, debugging, inspection, performance, future proof, and ease of use. Um, I will focus mainly about managing complexity and testing, and less um, so about performance, future proof, and ease of use, because they are also like, um, they don't have that much depth to it. And um, let's start with managing complexity. And for this, I will uh, introduce something that's related to my, um, um, my um, employer, which is Heidelberger Druck machine. We produce like those large scale printing machines. Um, they are massive, so you can see like this little uh, man here on the right. He stands right there where there's the, the feeder, so the paper gets sucked in. And then those, um, those units here, each unit applies a single color to the sheet. And then in the middle, we have like a perfecto, we call it, which just flips the paper. And then we have another four units, which print um, another, like another four colors on the paper. And then finally, there's some coating, some dryer, a powder, so the, the paper doesn't get, um, um, like paper doesn't stick to each other. And finally, we have a delivery. And those machines, they print um, 18,000 sheets an hour. So like they're massive in size, they're really loud, and they're fairly complex, those machines. So when I first started working for Heidelberg, I was like, yeah, printing machines. But when I saw this, I was completely amazed. Well, how huge are they? And this is like just a standard model. You get machines with 20 of those units. And talking about complexity, I'm just, um, this is like a schematic view of a single printing unit. And you can, th you can see all of those different, um, different cylinders here, applying the color and distributing the color. Fairly complex, but anyway, we collect lots of IoT data from those machines, temperatures, electrical currents, movements, quality measurements, everything you can think of. But there is an issue to this IoT data that we are collecting um, for quite some time. So that's like a huge benefit that we have, that we have um, this data for more than 10 or 15 years by now. But this originally was like developer logging, meant for developers to understand their modules or like the software and the hardware that they developed. And um, to give you an example of the data, first a quick description, we do have a timestamp, we have some channel information, it's like where this, this um, 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 event occurred, then we have some, <laughs> some string like message, then we have a message ID, and then we have some numeric param um, value here. And um, in the best case, um, there is a unique message ID and we have some numeric value, there is no further parsing or filtering required. It's just the value is there and no additional logic is required to get this data out of the raw logging. Um, but that's only 10% um, the case. So the next one is, well, we still have a unique ID, this 10,001, 
but then, well, the information is not numeric anymore, so it's just zero. It doesn't contain any information, but the information is given as a message string. And this message string is somewhat XML-like. So we already have to, provide, have to um, apply some regexes here to get the information out of there. The next one, it gets even spicier. Now it's not like um, I mean XML anymore. It's more JSON-like, but not, not really a JSON. So you can't use off-the-shelf JSON decoders. And then you see all those different hex codes. And those hex codes, they're fairly complex to, to, to decode. So we have to actually um, fetch lots of information from several R&D databases to make, those, to make this data point any speaking for humans. And then the last example is like the kind of the worst. So we don't have any um, unique um, message IDs anymore, but rather we have to combine a message ID with a channel information, and then we just have some arbitrary string that we have to pass. And it's quite challenging. And then you can imagine software versions, they increase, and then those things may change, then things break, so we have to account for many different um, um, uh, failures here. So which makes this issue just of extracting the data fairly complex. And um, so the challenge in general is that we have some raw IoT data in various forms, and we need some sort of standardization layer to, um, that we call extractors. And then finally, the result is some qualified data that I can um, um, put my analytics um, logic on top. So what I'm now showing is um, a simplified PySpark implementation that we came up with in order to solve this issue. Um, and just to quickly um, explain a few things here, we, we use abstract base, abstract base classes to enforce an interface. We use um, class attributes here to provide some um, additional meta information, such as like, is this a classified um, extractor, or is this like, um, for which software versions does this extractor work, for example. Um, we allow some configurable behavior, such as like in the production environment, we only want to um, retrieve like numeric values. However, when we do a prototype um, or like an ad hoc analysis, we might just want to see the labels instead of the numeric values to so make it more speaking. Um, we enforce an implementation of a filter method. So this defines what rows are relevant. We enforce the creation of a path method. So this is explicitly the, what um, logic is required to extract the information. This is usually like regexes and some string operations. And then um, we also enforce um, like a validate method. We force our developers to provide a validate method. So they have to think about how can I ensure that the results that I get extracted are correct. And then finally, we just provide like a base simplified um, extraction method. And um, to see an example of this, um, this is the totalizer. The totalizer is specific to printing machines. This is like how many sheets have been printed on this printing machine. And then we provide some text, some meta information, as I mentioned before, like it could be like, is this one validated? Has it been classified? What software versions does it work for? And so on. We provide a very simplified filter condition. We have a very simplified pass. In this case, we just cast to integer, and then there is some validate. And in the end, you can instantiate this extractor, and then you can use it on a given Spark data frame. So why do I telling you this? Why do I tell you this? Um, I want to um, pick up or pick out a few things that um, enable or that um, help us managing complexity here. For one, we can define interfaces with Python. And the benefit of using interfaces is that you can explicitly communicate intent and purpose to your developers and also to your users who then use those um, interfaces. Um, we do um, abstract away implementation details, so the end user doesn't see anything beneath it. It doesn't, like, the user does not need to know about this. And also, we decouple the user from its implementation. We don't create any direct dependencies, but rather we just focus on the interface itself. And one really important um, thing is design by contract, because in our company, lots of different developers made their own implementations, but they were all completely different. There was like no standard API. And now having like a shared understanding, a shared interface, um, 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 there is no more like wild west of extractors, similar to the wild west of the raw IT data that we've seen. Next thing, reusability and dry. Well, we can use inheritance, we can share code, we can use functions in this case, um, um, and um, we don't have to rewrite it again and again and again. Um, also an important part, in my opinion, is separations of concern. I do separate the filter and pass part here. Think of SQL. Well, it's always coupled. You have a single SQL statement, and you have your filter condition and your pass condition. You can't test those independently, whereas in this case, we have a filter method that we can pass individually or separately also from the pass step. And yes, we can leverage meta information. I talked about this. And we can also enable composability. So let's think of um, you're doing some ad hoc analysis. You want to just say, I need those three extractors here, some like totalizer. We want a software version. And we want to get some information about the machine state. Then I can put them what we call an extractor stage, or think of a pipeline. And then we can um, just run these at once. And these functionalities, they're really hard to achieve with plain SQL. 
So defining interfaces, I'm not aware of a way to define interfaces in SQL. Um, usability in try, yes, you can use stored procedures, but they come with their own drawbacks as well, regarding testability, for example, separation of concerns, I have no idea. Um, leveraging meta information, yes, you can use comments, but you can't really inspect these at runtime. And also composability, like this example I showed before, compose different extractors to a pipeline, mm, hard to achieve. And yes, there's dbt to the rescue, so I guess who of you, uh, who of you knows um, dbt? was used, yeah, quite a lot. So, um, and what is dbt? Well, um, they themselves say this uh, from the current uh, documentation, they say, well, they are the programming environment for SQL, uh, giving you the ability to do things that aren't normally possible in SQL. And then they provide some examples here using control structures such as if statements or for loops. And also down the bottom it says, um, abstract snippets of SQL into reusable macros, analogous to functions in most programming languages. So um, the funny thing is dbt itself is written in Python using a Jinja templating language written in Python to generate SQL templates, which then are then um, passed to our database um, engines. Um, yeah, I, don't, I can skip this example. So taking a look at this, um, dbt improves the situation for many things, but still it's not on par with the actual data from API. So summing up managing complexity, um, um, since Spark is, or PySpark, Apache Spark can be embedded in a programming language, a general purpose language, it provides a, like a huge toolbox of um, abstractions. And one thing that I really like is that you can dynamically generate building blocks of your data pipeline. Whereas SQL and its surrounding frameworks, they basically fall short in this regard. So, First um, implication, yeah, when it comes to managing complexity, I'd say uh, we have a smiley for Apache Spark and we're not so sure or we're less more of a frowny for um, our cloud native SQL engines. Now when it comes to testing, typically um, programming languages, they have testability as a first class citizen or as a design principle in mind. However, when we look at SQL, well, the from table is always hard-coded. It's not like a parameter that you can pass to a function in exchange and can mock for your test functions. No, it doesn't work that way. It's really hard to test SQL. So if you have any good solutions to unit test your SQL snippets, please um, approach me um, because I'm still struggling with this. And this is like my personal observation that it doesn't seem to be like a general vendor independent, easy to use testing framework in the SQL space. Yes, you can do tests for yet like data tests as um, uh, dbt provides, like you have non-nulls, um, there are no duplicates and such things. You can even extend it with great expectations. Um, but really, unit testing, you have some input data and some expected output data, uh, just like in classical software engineering. This doesn't seem to exist in the SQL space. Um, so again, I asked that GPT, and um, is there, uh, I don't know, how does the Python testing ecosystem compare to the SQL testing ecosystem? And then just have a look at the um, highlighted path there. It says the SQL testing ecosystem, on the other hand, is still developing. Wait a minute, half a century old, and the testing ecosystem is still developing? So there's something strange about the language, like by design, that we do not have a t proper testing system in SQL still um, today. Well, I, I, it struck me. Um, there is some extension to dbt to do your unit testing, but well, <laughs> supplying your test data in SQL, uh, really hard. And on the other hand, uh, Python, PyTest, yeah, PyTest, who knows, who uses PyTest? Um, yeah, quite a lot of people. And PyTest is just so great because you can dynamically generate tests, you can use components, mock dependencies, um, rerun fail tests, code coverage, everything you can think of, and also more advanced features such as property-based testing or mutation testing. It's just possible, it's out there. You can use like the rich ecosystem. Um, however, um, we can skip this for now. Summing up, sorry. Um, um, Spark gets a smiley here and SQL gets a frowny here. I think I need to hurry a bit. Um, yeah, so when it comes to debugging inspection, well with Spark, since it's like embedded in a programming language, just use your favorite IDE, step you through um, line by line, through your code. Um, with, uh, with SQL engines, I, I, I did some research on this and I was also surprised to find, well, it's not really possible to debug um, SQL. It's really hard, it's really challenging. Um, there's an example with Snowflake here. They ask, well, how can I debug um, a stored procedure? And they say, well, write some helper function to print out something to a different table. I, w w w that's not debugging that I'm used to. Um, the same if you look at, um, 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 I think this is a big query in this example, they have a, <laughs> an error statement. Um, so you manually add, yes, there's an error, but that's not debugging, but it's a debugging function, they call it. Um, 
strange, isn't it? When it comes to inspection, um, um, Spark offers like a rich UI to understand each and every part of um, your driver and your executors. It's really detailed, but you have to be an expert, but you can detect data SQ, you can detect low CPU utilization, everything is possible. With Snowflake in this case, um, it's less detailed, but very intuitive, but you might miss an important part. So when it comes to debugging inspection, um, um, we say, yes, Spark um, looks great here. SQL, like cloud native SQL engines, well, they are okay, but they could be better. Um, yep. When it comes to performance, um, this is also an interesting part. Um, um, just um, this morning, there was a talk on substrate um, and error-based computation engines. Um, 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 put it differently, um, Databricks is the Spark company. So the creators of Spark, um, they founded Databricks, and at, at, at their core, they have like the Spark engine. But they also developed now like a custom C++ engine called Photon, which is then substitutes the heavy compute workloads array from the JVM. So if the Spark company develops their own custom computation engine, which does not use the Spark engine anymore, this tells us there's something wrong with the um, original um, JVM engine within Spark. Um, and um, there have been like open source initiatives such as Blaze, which they do, they still keep Spark as a scheduler to generate a DAG to create like a physical execution plan, but then they use not the JVM engine anymore, but rather use an error-based computation engine. And also there's um, now this um, approach to um, translate Spark um, um, DAG into a substrate and then have some native C++ engines doing the execution also in the open source space. So this is like um, analogous to the Photon engine that Databricks um, developed in a proprietary way, but then open sourced. So there will be in the future some improvement, I assume, for the Spark um, computation engine. So in this case, I'd say, well, those highly sophisticated um, distributed engines of our cloud native um, SQL providers such as Snowflake, they have an edge here and they have an advantage here. So ease of use, um, and with the ease of use, there's a clear winner, cloud native SQL engines, because using Spark, it requires you at least a proficiency in a programming language using it. Um, it can be difficult to set up um, Apache Spark tests on your local machine and in CI in the first place, um, and this is like an important part. Apache Spark really forces you to think about the distributed execution, um, a distributed computation and lazy execution model. You have to think about how to parallelize your code. You have to think about different ways how to join. With SQL, everything is abstracted away. You just have declarative approach and you have no imperative choices here. And also, as I said, setting up an Apache, Clark, Apache Spark cluster um, is still quite complicated, even though there are many managed cloud services, but still you have to think about the driver, you have your executors, how much memory do I need, how many cores, what is like the level of parallelism that I am at there. And what, you have to think about caching too, like if you, you reuse data, you have to cache it, otherwise it will load again and again and again, which is um, less performant. You have to think about, or you have to also understand if you have data SQ, you have less um, CPU utilization, you're solving some techniques. Well, well, as Spark grows as a framework, they have included more and more optimizations, such as the adaptive query execution. Um, but still, Spark is still um, more difficult to use. So in this case, there are those cloud native SQL engines. They're easy to spin up. Just say T-shirt size, I want an XL cluster, and then I use my SQL, and the engine does everything um, for you in the background. So no need to hurry. Of course, you can use SQL with Spark and just let it run, but often um, it's better to have a look um, at what um, the Spark engine is doing. That's my experience from the past. So when it comes to future proof, um, I think um, since Apache Spark is vendor independent and they are managed Spark runtimes on all major um, cloud providers. We do have like on AWS, you can AWS, use AWS Clue, you can run Amazon EMR on EC2, on EKS, now even serverless. Um, nowadays, Athena um, integrates with Spark. You can <laughs> pass your Spark code to Athena. How crazy is this? Um, you can use Azure Synapse to run your Spark workloads. You have Google Data Brock, and of course, we have Databricks, um, um, which of course is the Spark runtime or the Spark engine. And um, um, yeah, when the independence, uh, that's important, um, really important, but I think in general to sum up, um, in the future, both of these won't go away, so my expectations is in the next five years all of these will remain. So wrapping up, um, we, um, we had this matrix in the beginning and now let's put everything together. We see those frownies and smileys. And uh, I guess you can detect a pattern here, and also that's <laughs> the way that the talk was structured chronologically. Um, 
Um, we, do, we do see some benefits here for Spark for certain aspects, and we see some more like positive aspects for our cloud native SQL engines. And um, um, this is my personal recommendation or my personal opinion. If you have business critical data pipelines with high complexity, then I would choose a Spark over SQL because I have more possibilities to manage complexity. I can build my own powerful abstractions on top of it. I can um, have <laughs> proper testing support. I actually can do unit test. Um, and I have proper um, debugging and inspection methods with Spark, which really lack in the SQL space. However, um, if you already have like a high, or like if you reached a sufficient level of analytical readiness, so there's no, so not, so not so much more complexity in your data, then please use SQL. I would never use Spark for um, writing my SQL, like my, my dashboard queries, no way. As long as you, as long as you have like first level filter and um, aggregations, um, um, then just happily use SQL. But please don't write those walls of SQL um, commands with like uh, 10 CTEs and recursive functions. It's hard to understand, it's hard to reason about. Um, use language, use a tool which is more appropriate for the issue at hand. And basically this is my closing word. So in this case, complementary because use Spark for those uh, things which are more complex, where we require testing and managing complexity, and happily use um, SQL and cloud native SQL engines for things that um, are suitable for this. And that's it, thank you.